By the end of this decade, the United States wants to build a nuclear reactor on the moon. We are in the race, we're in a race to the moon, in a race with China to the moon, and uh, to have a, a base on the moon, we need energy. Energy is important, and if we're going to be able to sustain life on the moon to then go to Mars, this technology is critically important. Energy is important. This week, U.S. Acting NASA Administrator Sean Duffy directed the agency to speed up plans to build a lunar nuclear reactor. So the plan will see NASA begin talks with the private sector over possible designs in two months with a target launch very soon of 2030. For more on the feasibility of this, we're joined this morning from Lancaster, United Kingdom by Lionel Wilson, Professor Emeritus of Earth and Planetary Sciences at Lancaster University. Good morning. Good morning, I'm Mary. We are talking about a different type of space race here. The U.S. aiming to beat other nations with plans to build a lunar nuclear reactor. First of all, why would the U.S. and other countries even be interested in building a reactor on the moon? Uh, the key issue here is providing electricity power to uh, any base on the moon. Um, the basic plan is to use solar power. You know, the moon has no atmosphere, so there's no wind, and um, no, no renewable resources like coal, nothing like uh, production of forests or anything happens like that on the moon. So um, solar power is the obvious thing. And depending on where you build your base, um, this is critical because the moon rotates slowly on its axis as it moves around the Earth. It takes 28 days to revolve once. That means that over most of the moon, you get 14 days of sunlight, which is great for uh, electrical power, and 14 days of darkness, which means you, lots of, you need lots of batteries to mm -hmm. store energy. Now, if you had something that produced power all the time, that would reduce the dependency. And uh, that's the key issue here, that um, radioisotope generators are generating heat and that's converted into electricity all the time. Duffy, so, even if you have a solar power system, you know, if it has a fault, you have a backup uh, to, to fall back on. Duffy linked this uh, need for energy and for power to uh, populating the moon. We'll get to that in a moment. But first of all, mm -hmm. let's talk ownership. There are international guidelines on how countries should approach space development, right? The Artemis Accords mm -hmm. outlines principles for cooperation in the civil exploration and use of the moon, Mars, comets, and asteroids for, quote, peaceful purposes. 56 countries have signed on, including ours, Canada. What power agreement, what power do agreements like this have over what can be built on the moon and by who? I don't think they affect very much what can be built in the sense that that's limited by technology and the desire to do it and the commitment to commit the money. Um, they they do uh, affect um, whether, you're, whether you have a conscience of whether you want to stick by the rules or not. And uh, to be cynical, people haven't always stuck to the rules. <laughs> I don't think that's being cynical. I think that's being honest. Uh, NASA's crewed Artemis mission, as you are aware, has been pushed back multiple times. The target date right now is set for mid-2027. So can we talk timelines? How realistic is NASA's 2030 nuclear reactor goal if we can't even get humans to the moon before 2027? Well, um, it's true there's no point in getting the power source to the moon if you're not getting the people there. But as regards actually producing a suitable power source, I, I think that's not really a problem in that timeline. The reason I say that is because we already have uh, what I assume is the type of reactor that, uh, that they're planning to build. Um, these are used to power spacecraft going into the outer part of the solar system. If you go in towards the sun, you get lots of free electricity from solar power. If you go further out, the sun gets dimmer. Eventually, you're losing enough power to, to power a spacecraft. So you use um, basically plutonium as a, a heat source and uh, connect that to electrical circuits which convert heat to electricity. And all of the spacecraft that have gone into the outer part of the solar system have used these systems. But the point is, of course, <clears throat> you don't need too much power for a spacecraft. Typically something like 
um, one kilogram of plutonium producing five or six hundred watts is enough to power a spacecraft. So systems like that are, <laughs> feel like, available over the counter. Um, <laughs> that's simple. But um, I see that uh, what was specified in that uh, release from NASA headquarters was the desire to have a 100 kilowatt generator. And doing the math on using the same kind of design that I've just described, you would need 200 kilograms, so about one-fifth of a tonne of plutonium, to produce the desired amount of electricity. Um, I'm sure there must be other isotopes that you could use, some of which might be less attractive from a safety point of view, but I think that's the ballpark that you would need to satisfy what they've announced so far. It's perhaps worth my saying that uh, 100 kilowatts well, that, uh, that would run my house quite efficiently, <laughs> but uh, a large lunar base is going to need a lot more power than that. Certainly. Uh, so, listen. you know, that, that's the issue. How far do you go with this? Professor Wilson, I'm certainly glad it is your job to do that math and not mine. I appreciate you coming on this morning. Thanks for being with us. My pleasure. Thank you. Mm. If you like that video, make sure to subscribe to the Your Morning YouTube feed, where you can find all kinds of new content posted every weekday morning.